So. All right. Uh, yeah, it's all. Yes. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, um, I think we're going to start. Okay. Because we can. So I've just got a little bit of uh, a few few remarks to, to make, of course, before we before we get started. Okay, let's do it. And uh, so, anybody, anyway, welcome everybody, including Christina and everybody who is watching, wherever you're watching, however you're watching. Um, my name is Mark Mamagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser. Uh, some of you know me, perhaps some of you don't. And if you don't, how do you do? Welcome and thanks for joining us. Back on March 12th, when Nasser announced that we were closing down our new building and suspending all public programs, and like the rest of the world, uh, we knew very little about what the immediate future would look like. Um, two months plus later, well, we're still not entirely sure what the immediate future looks like, uh, but that isn't to say nothing has changed since March. Of course, a lot of things have. But we will continue to follow the guidelines of competent authorities, which you're free to interpret uh, as, as you like, uh, in terms of reopening our, our building and resuming normal activities. Our online bookstore is back online as of yesterday or today, so you are able to purchase books online through our website, and we would certainly encourage you to do so. The, the Nasser Vartan Gregorian building remains closed to the public, and as I say, we will continue to assess the situation in light of available information. Believe me, we're as eager to welcome you to the building as I hope you are eager to come visit the building or to return to the building if you've already been there. In the meantime, we've been carrying on with other important projects, including continuing the work of cataloging our library. Uh, we've launched several new online features, including the Treasures from the Nasser Mardigian Library uh, online uh, weekly feature, which we hope you've been enjoying. And we've been highlighting some recordings on our YouTube channel from the past recent past and the more uh, distant past. We have a lot of material there, including some other wonderful lectures by Professor Maratsi. Oh. So we hope you'll check that out. I would be most remiss if I didn't mention that Nasser has a small staff that always works hard and is certainly working hard now uh, during these very trying times. I would exclude myself from that. The main thing I'm doing, as you can see, is growing my hair. <laughs> Sarah Ignatius is the Nasser Executive Director, Ani Babayan is Nasser's Library Curator, and Laura Yardumian is Nasser's Program and Administrative Associate. They're watching. I wish I could thank them for everything that they're doing right now uh, in, in person, but I hope wherever you are, you will quietly applaud for them because they're doing tremendous work to keep Nasser going uh, and to continue the work in these, in these uh, challenging situations. And I hope that if you are a Nasser member, uh, you will continue to be, and we thank you. And if you aren't a Nasser member, please consider becoming one because we need your support now as much as ever. Of course, tonight marks the first online program that we are hosting. And while I wish I could be speaking to you in person from our building on Concord Avenue in Belmont, I am at least speaking to you from Belmont. Uh, albeit from my house. Uh, but it's a half a mile from the Nasser building, so that's almost the same thing. And I know that many of you are joining us tonight from around the United States and actually uh, from around the world. So while we miss the in-person contact, we embrace the opportunity to reach new people in new ways. And we will continue to do so. I assure you that uh, there are other online programs being planned for the near future, and we will keep doing these uh, into the future to bring our programming to anyone who wishes to uh, take it in. These programs will be accessible either through Zoom or as live streams on YouTube, or as is the case tonight, both. And they will be available afterwards on YouTube as well. 
I ask for your indulgence if there are any technical glitches since we are new at this. I don't anticipate any, but if I anticipated them, then they wouldn't be glitches, would they? Tonight's program is one of those that had to be postponed, and so we're delighted to have this chance to offer it in this new format. The city of Ani has occupied a special place in Armenian history and the Armenian imagination and in Armenian scholarship for a long time. We are most fortunate to have Christina Maranzi tonight to shed new light on Ani based on her recent research and investigations. Christina Maranzi is the Arthur H. Dadian and R.T. Ostamel Professor of Armenian Art and serves as the chair of the Department of Art and Architecture, uh, Art and Art History rather, at Tufts University. She's published and lectured widely on, on Armenian art and architecture and related subjects. And she is the author of three previous monographs and over 70 essays, articles, and reviews. Her books include Medieval Armenian Architecture, Constructions of Race and Nation, 2001, Vigilant Powers, Three Churches of Early Medieval Armenia, 2015, and The Art of Armenia, an Introduction, 2019. She's also a valued and valuable member of Nasser's Academic Advisory Committee and a friend of many years standing to this organization. And it is a great pleasure once again to have the chance to welcome her. One last word about format. Christina will speak and she will show her presentation and you have the option of sending in questions via Zoom. We will get to some of these. Uh, we will not probably get to all of these. I uh, don't want anybody to take it personally. If you don't get, if we don't get to your question, no worries. Uh, and now I will turn things over to Christina and say, it's all yours. Thanks. Okay. Hi everybody. This is really weird and different. Thank you so much, Mark. Friend of many years. Um, if something, seriously, if something goes wrong, uh, I will try to get out of Zoom and back into Zoom as fast as I can. I just, I have worries, but hopefully, it, do I seem okay so far, Mark? Can you? Yeah, good. All right. Um, I'm going to make this on the quick side. So my presentation will be like around 30 minutes, maybe not longer. Um, and also, if you have questions that, that we don't get to live, please email me. I'm happy to answer any questions. This is a, this is a group effort. I want to thank Nasser so much. You know, I realize now that Nasser is closed, how much I miss it. Um, I always, I mean, I love Nasser, but this is really very sad that Nasser isn't open right now with their beautiful new building. So come back soon, Nasser. And um, we all wish you good health. Um, so yeah, much appreciated. Where did you go, Mark? You're gone now. I Okay, that's fine. And you've muted yourself. All right, now I'm really all alone in this weird world, but welcome everyone. Um, I want to start by just thanking Mark, thanking Nasser. I want to thank everybody whose pace, patience I've tested over the past year with this project. I've asked a lot of people their opinions and feedback. And so I want to thank everybody, my husband, my long suffering husband, my parents, my friends, my students, undergrads and grads and colleagues, everybody, um, colleagues in Armenia, colleagues here, everywhere for their um, endless collegiality and patience with me as I satisfy my obsessions. And one of those obsessions I'm gonna put on the screen for you right now. So let's get started. Oh, I need to do screen share. That would be a good idea. Share screen. Host disabled attendee screen. Sh Mark, I think I need you. Can you come back? Yes. Yes, um, Christina. For some reason, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay. Um, should I? No, get... no, hang on, hang okay. on. Okay, it should be okay now. Okay, let's try. Ah, great, okay. So, share. Okay, you can now all see my nice desktop. Let's get started. 
Okay, so can you see my presentation, Mark? You're my guinea pig. Yes. Okay, newly discovered wall paintings at Ani or Armenian art history in lockdown. How appropriate. Um, okay, my story starts last summer. I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, June 30th, around 2.30 in the afternoon, I was minding my own business when I encountered this guy. Look carefully. You can probably see what it is. It's a bovine. I don't know how long it took you to figure it out because I don't know how many people are out there or what their reactions are, but it is in fact a bovine. Um, when I saw this, I'm just gonna say ox because that's what it is. Um, I was shocked. I had never seen it before. I thought I knew something about Armenian art. And this is the first time I was seeing this boy. Um, that was very surprising. My first reaction um, was to carry my computer over to my husband's study, it's fairly traditional, I guess, to ask him if I was going crazy. Um, he said, no, I see that too. All this was very exhilarating because this ox appeared on one of the most famous of Armenian churches, the Cathedral of Ani. So we were both excited. Then I wrote to a couple of colleagues um, and you can see what I wrote. I hope they won't mind, but basically um, they're working on something related and uh, I wanted to show them my ox. So, we all shared our astonishment over different time zones and different parts of uh, the world. Um, and over the next several weeks, I discovered more and more evidence that was exciting. So my second reaction was to scour the previous literature and you graduate students out there know how it feels when you think you have um, found something really exciting that nobody has seen before. And then you worry, oh God, it's got to be in some German dissertation from 100 years ago. So I did a lot of combing the sources and there are some wonderful 19th and early 20th century Armenian um, antiquarian accounts, um, records of epigraphy and um, topography that I studied, Alishan, Nersa, Sarkisian, to see if I could find any evidence, any mention of this ox or any um, anything about the frescoes at Ani Cathedral. And uh, long story short, I haven't yet. Um, so why is this? Well, why, why is there, am I the first person to find this ox? And I think that's a complicated question. On the one hand, Armenian art has focused for centuries on uh, manuscripts and architecture. So that's sort of the two big genres in the field of Armenian art. They have long been studied. Um, wall paintings, much less so. Uh, wall paintings usually come under the category of decoration and they are shunted off into the very end of a long architectural description. So um, there's that. Um, one, a related reason is because there's just so much more of the manuscripts, almost 40,000 manuscripts that we know of, Armenian manuscripts, um, and thousands of churches and monasteries. So the evidence is quite weighted in terms of manuscripts and architecture. Um, the other reason is that not a whole lot of wall paintings um, seem to survive in good shape. So we do know of wall painting from even the earliest of churches. They, these have been studied, but as you can see, um, there isn't a whole lot that is intact. Uh, we start seeing well, Armenian wall paintings more in the seventh century. This is an example we'll talk about again, Lombatha Vank from the seventh century, which is, you can hopefully see, is, is actually also damaged. Um, better examples, uh, occur in 
the 10th century with Akhtamar, the famous church of Akhtamar, and also um, and then in the 13th century with another famous painted church, the church of St. Gregory the Illuminator, Tigran Honens at Ani. Um, so why is this corpus so small? Why is the number of examples of wall paintings that we have so small? Um, scholars have offered various reasons for this. One has to do with um, the technical problems of wall painting uh, adhering or rather not adhering to the wall. And you will often hear this, that uh, Armenian wall surfaces did not have um, a sufficient matrix for the fresco to kind of be glued onto, and so the frescoes just slipped off, although there has been questioning of this thesis. Um, another reason given is the climate, hot summers, cold winters, um, led to the shrinking and expanding of the plaster and the stone. Seismicity in the region is another reason that's often given too. Um, all these things could be tested, uh, I suppose, to come to a firm answer. But another cultural reason needs to be um, spoken of, and that is iconoclasm and vandalism, um, different things, sometimes shared, sometimes different, but um, we can see a good example of um, the destruction of, the deliberate destruction of Armenian wall paintings here at the Church of Moren um, from the seventh century. So there are a variety of reasons why, both cultural and, um, and uh, I guess technical, why Armenian wall paintings don't survive. But this, all of this, these, these reasons have not encouraged anybody to go looking for wall paintings. That is, if you don't think that you're gonna find them, then you won't look for them and then they won't be there. So it's kind of a circular thing. Um, and this is where I think we've been limited in the past. So the published material on, um, from the previous century only registered what could be seen by the naked eye before digital cameras and image adjustment software like Photoshop. The potential for using these tools is tremendous. And I learned this several years ago in my study of the Church of Moren. Um, and I've talked about this church a lot. I won't get into it too much, but it stands on the Turkish side of the military, closed military border between the republics of Turkey and Armenia. Um, and involves sometimes rather, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, furtive um, visits to the site, including one three hour hike where I was just so glad to um, be inside the church away from the scrutiny of the military police. And you see the, my little label at the top there. I was so glad to be inside the church that I just rested there for a while escaping the heat and the scrutiny of the police. Um, at that time, it seemed like a good moment to examine the, the apps. And as I did, um, and here's the apps, the interior of Moran, as I did more and more, and more I started seeing things in, um, in the curvature um, here of the apps. So I took time, I just bought an expensive lens for my camera. I took time and just snapped everything I could in the apps, knowing that I could probably go back to my hotel and look at it with greater leisure. So that's what I did. And anytime I thought I saw anything in that apps, I would just take a picture so that, um, so that I could then play with the images later um, using image adjustment software. So you see on the left, a normal photo from Moren and then adjusted uh, with Photoshop. And you can see hopefully fairly clearly the hand holding the scroll with the little cuff of his, um, his sleeve right there. Um, this is just another image from Moran. I found that the church was really, the Eastern part of the church was covered in frescoes and there are more there that, than I have been able to um, examine. So I hope to go back. In fact, just at this very moment, I'm seeing an Armenian inscription up here. Wow. Every moment you find something new. That's with Photoshop. Um, so collating this evidence from Moran, um, partially using Adobe Illustrator and the assistance of my friend, Stephen Sim, 
um, we were able to put together a line drawing of what that apps looked like. And I finished it up by adding to the fragmentary inscription, um, the completion of that inscription, with, which is Psalm 92, 93, holiness befits your house, O Lord, for the length of days, dan cum vaile serputun der entier gain avurus. Um, this was not only one of the earliest biblical inscriptions that we know of on, on a monument in Armenia, but also here we have the most complete surviving apsidal fresco from Armenia. So very important and really done um, with the help of technology. So um, that was Mren, this is now, haha. -ha. Um, and I hadn't really thought about Mren much for many years. Um, and then I was reading a paper that a prospective student wrote. Um, and I hope she doesn't mind that I put her name up here on the, the, the screen because she wrote to, um, a paper about Ani and she wrote about wall paintings. And she, she said, um, you know, said what Sr. Peter Nocession said, which is that we um, don't have much remain, remaining from um, 10th century wall paintings in Armenia. And she was, uh, Atine was speaking about Ani and my basic reaction was other than being really interested and in, she's actually coming to, to Tufts in the fall, whatever that means, so I'm excited to have her. Um, I wondered, is this true? What do we know about the wall paintings in, um, in churches from the 10th century? And, and would they repay closer investigation and, and the use of Photoshop? So that's what I did. That's what I then turned to. And my first, um, my first uh, plan of attack was to go and look at my photographs from Ani, which I had taken over the years. Um, for the past, since my first trip in the 90s, I had taken many, many, many photographs of Ani and Ani Cathedral in particular. So that's where I started. I wanted to look at re and review my photographs of Ani Cathedral. Um, Ani Cathedral is of course uh, a masterpiece of architecture and is um, often studied for its architecture and discussed for its architecture. But you could probably even tell from this slide, oops, from this slide that there is some uh, painting in here just from the way the, there are dark splotches on, um, on the apps. Um, and these splotches, um, it's not an art historical term, but whatever, um, have been uh, written about by scholars. So I'm not the first one to write about the frescoes at Ani Cathedral. And I'm listing for you here, due diligence, what everybody else has said. Um, and what you, what you get from this uh, multilingual um, corpus is that there is some traces of wall painting, but it's not a lot. Um, there are um, you know, some faint images of the enthroned Christ. Um, and then in some cases it says, this is probably later, it's probably 13th century. Um, so I, that's all I knew. And that's when I thought, okay, you know, along with what Atina said, I'm going to go look at these, look at these paintings. Um, so I had taken lots of photographs of the apps. You're looking at one of them here. Let's start looking at this um, more closely. So here you have an image of the apps. Here is um, my oval of uh, the detail I want you to look at. So look at it carefully. That um, is an area that I'm going to change with Photoshop. And this is what it ends up being in Photoshop. So back for a second and then here. And you can see that what I've done is bring out the um, colors. I've intensified the colors and I've also increased um, the, the tonal range. So you get more contrast. Um, and you can see, I hope that what you're looking at is a throne. So this is pretty visible to the naked eye if you know what you're looking for, but much more so, much more detail when you subject it to Photoshop. And maybe you can even see the use of gold to um, imitate the clamps that would have set these wonderful jewels uh, in place. So let's now, so now we've established that's a throne. Let's go all the way to the other side of the apps and let's look at what's there. And maybe you, again, you can see there's an outline of something over here, excuse me. Um, 
And here you see it again, I've just made a detail for you of it. And you can probably tell, yeah, there's something there. And then I'm adding here the image with Photoshop and you can see that what you have is an angel. So you have a face, you have the halo up here, white, looks like it's white, the wing here, um, an elbow. And maybe if you look carefully, you can see there's a hand here and the hand is holding something. Um, and then there's more drapery down here. So we have an angel all the way on the left who is getting his, her debut um, on YouTube with this, uh, with this presentation. Now I wanna take you over to, again, back over to the right side and we're gonna look here and there is our friend, the ox um, with Photoshop and this is an animation. You can see what it is I am doing. So um, I'm going from, just go back for a minute, this and then you can see what I'm doing now. What am I doing in fact? Um, okay, so what I did to create this image, and this is a screenshot of Photoshop, um, I kind of threw my image file into Photoshop and I played with a few different tools. Um, you see them here. Uh, one of them is called levels and the other is called curves. Um, I should say full disclosure, I'm not a technological person. I don't know half the time what I'm doing. I play an experiment, but I'm not, I don't really know how this stuff works. But uh, what I found was that it actually uh, brought out images. So I used leveled and levels and curves, which changed um, and sort of, I think, pulled apart the tones, the tonal ranges um, in useful ways. And then I also used um, brightness contrast. I used um, hue and saturation. Um, in no case, and I wanna make this really clear, in no case did I add or subtract any isolated lines, points, or zones. So I didn't go in there and draw this, just so you know, that didn't happen. What I did was change the overall image um, to see what I could find. Um, another useful tool that I used was inversion. And inversion, um, I, don't, I hope you can see this because my, my face is covering up where, um, where the image would be, but inversion essentially inverts the colors. This is very useful in surprising ways. This on the left is a um, good. On the left is uh, the Church of the Savior from Ani, and you can see a wall painting normal on the left where it just looks like the white parts, it may not be clear, but then on the right, you see it inverted and actually it reads um, much more easily. This can be helpful, not in terms of getting a true sense of what the image looked like, but for the purposes of reading the image for the purposes of interpretation. Okay, so um, the other thing, why did I just, oh yeah. So the other thing I did, um, I use these tools and tools are great, but we all know that um, the digital world is fun and you can learn a lot, um, but it doesn't have all the answers. So it's great that I was able to uncover these images, but if I didn't know what to look for, then it would be very confusing and I wouldn't have found everything I did. That is, I needed to know what to expect in the apps of a church. I needed to know something about the conventions of Armenian Christian art in order to do this work. It was the combination of having the technology and the art historical disciplinary knowledge that um, I think was uh, led me to be able to have some results. For example, it, you wouldn't expect to find um, in an apps, an image of Kim Kardashian or a smiley face. You would expect to find an image of Christ. Um, you would expect apostles, a cross, so there were certain um, possibilities that I could, or probabilities that I could follow. And that, that was important to my work as well. Okay, another thing that, that was helpful was an understanding of the internal stylistic logic, let's say, of the painting. So 
if I was able to determine on our angel on the left, what the wings looked like over here, I might be able to find similar wings elsewhere on the fresco. And I'm showing you what I think might be wings here. Um, and this is in the center of the uh, apse near the throne. And I think this is probably the eagle here of John. I'll explain why in a minute. Then you see these eyes of our ox. So this is how our artist makes eyes, to put it bluntly. Well, you can see that he creates large limpid eyes, or she creates large limpid eyes with ducts. And you can see we have something that looks like a large limpid eye over here. This kind of work, which took many, many weeks and feedback from many people, um, allowed me to put together um, a sense of what the whole apps looked like. I did some drawing too, some of it better than others. And I came up with the following scheme, which was that there was a central image of Christ enthroned. There was an eagle on the left, um, symbolizing St. Mark, I'm sorry, eagle symbolizing St. John, a lion symbolizing St. Mark below, and maybe you can see the little, his little ear. Um, a man symbolizing Matthew and the our ox symbolizing Luke. So that was very helpful. Um, now there's more at Ani Cathedral and Mark, just stop me when you feel like I've said enough because I can wind it up. Um, there's more at Ani Cathedral. There's this figure over here. So all the way over here, you see a large splotch of paint. Uh, what is this? So, okay. There's a halo here. Maybe you can just make it out. And there's a head inside that. If you look carefully down here, can you see my cursor? Mark, just go on and tell me if you can. Um, there's a knee. This person is seated. Okay. This person is seated and this is his knee and there's some drapery here. So this is a large seated figure at the right end of the abs. Then there is this elbow and I can't, I don't know what the heck this elbow is. There's an elbow here and it's green. Why is it there? I've wondered this for a long time. I'm gonna to propose to you a reason why I'd love to get some more suggestions. This is a crowdsourcing kind of um, issue. Okay, so we'll get back to that mysterious elbow, but for the moment I wanna take you now outside of the apse proper, apse is here, and go here. So here we have an inscription. And I don't know why, but I don't think anybody's paid any attention to it before, but it's quite clear, you can see it. And it's an inscription that takes the form of a rolled scroll. So you see it has a little roll here and then it hangs down, it makes a little fold and then it hangs right down. Um, so much fun. When I find something like this where it's just barely visible letters, it's like a crossword puzzle and it's fun to work with. So again, I, in terms of probability, I, I thought, okay, this is gonna be a biblical inscription, most likely it's in an apse um, of a church. Um, and that's, that's also conventional for Armenian church architecture. So I looked very carefully at this um, and was able to make out some letters as you probably can too. And the, ones that, the one that really helped me was the, this part, M-E-R-T-E-A-L, Merzial, Merzial. Um, and then I thought I saw maybe Z, Z Merzial. Merzial was the, was the big clue. And then at the very end, uh, you will see is the abbreviation, because there's a, there's a line above it, for God. So, Astuzo. So, the first thing I did, I went to my favorite website, Arak29, and I looked for Merzeal, and I found 18 occurrences. So, that's not too bad. It's luckily one of those words that doesn't show up too much. Um, 18 occurrences, but only one of those ended in Astuzo. Lo and behold, it's Luke 10, 11. Uh, but you shall know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Zidas chik, zi merceale, arkayutun, 
Astuzzo. Okay, so full of portent and inscription, which may hold meaning for us today in these strange times, but full of portent and, and to think about the theology of this inscription at a millennial moment, because remember the Cathedral of Vani is 989 to 1001 is very interesting and separate historical issue. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Um, there's a whole lot more on this apse. There is a cross. You can see that pretty clearly. And if this was already noticed by Nikolai Kotanjan, the great um, scholar of wall paintings. Now here, I want you to look carefully. I have darkened this using Photoshop to bring out some things. I want you to look very carefully. This is the lower part of the apse. You can see that cross up here. Here's the window. Maybe if you look really carefully, you can see halos or somethings. I counted these. I got, I got about 12. I think what, we what you have here are the apostles. Now above the apse, and we're looking here again on my line drawing, is more. Um, you have these circles. Each one of these holds a figure. So here you have a face. Again, this has been um, manipulated with Photoshop where I've drawn out the colors and you can see a wonderful blue um, here in the corner. Um, but I hope you can see that there's a face here. Still managed to see it despite the fact that this has been whitewashed over. Um, the, the use of these medallions, by the way, is, um, is also known from other churches. So that's another thing that's helpful, knowing the conventions of fresco painting in terms of the subject matter, but also knowing where to expect to see certain things. Okay, I wanna turn now to iconography. Um, that is the study of subject matter and look a little bit at what it is we see. I told you we see Christ with the um, with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That is the the eagle, the man, the bull, and the lion. This is Christ with what is called the four living creatures, and this is a an image that derives from two places in the Bible: the vision of Ezekiel and Revelations. In Christian art, we start seeing it very early. Um, from the sixth century already. And I'm just showing you some examples on the upper left, the Rabula Gospels from the sixth century, um, the uh, apps of Apa Apollo from Bavit on the lower left. Again, Christ enthroned with the four living creatures. And you can see maybe the little man, the eagle, the ox and the lion. Up on the upper right from Thessaloniki, Christ with the four living creatures um, in a beautiful mosaic, probably from the sixth century. And then a detail from Armenia from the seventh century, the church of Lumbata Vank that I mentioned earlier. And here you see um, the same church um, with a detail showing you those four living creatures. Maybe just barely you can see it, but the, the man, the eagle, the lion, and the bull over here. So, um, so Lombata Vank provides us with our first example of the scene in Armenia. And otherwise you don't see a whole lot of this subject matter on monumental painting in Armenia. You see other things. You see Christ between angels at Akhtamar. You see a book on a throne at Tallinn, the stand in Christ in the seventh century. This is, so this isn't something that I found um, parallels for in Armenia from an early date. There is a very interesting one, and that is at Horomos, not very far from Ani, where we find, indeed, Christ between the four living creatures. So Christ enthroned, this is in a relief sculpture, showing angels here, and then below, the eagle, the lion, the man, and the yez, or the ox. I kept that in Armenian for fun. Um, Horomos is close to Ani, they are related. Horomos was the burial ground for the Bagratuni kings. Um, and it was in a sense, part of the, the broader landscape of Ani. And it's perfectly possible, I think, that that relief at Horomos was based on um, Ani Cathedral's painting. But that deserves more work. Okay, now iconography also brings up 
uh, an interesting exercise for us, which is to compare the text, the biblical text, where we find the four living creatures and the image we have here. I found particular resonance with the book of Ezekiel when I, um, when I was studying this fresco to the point where I wonder whether this image, this guy on the right, the enthroned guy next to the green elbow is Ezekiel himself. We know from Armenian manuscripts of a later time um, we have images of Christ in each of these three um, examples. This is from the 13th century, the Erzinka Bible. Christ is shown with the four living creatures below. And then you have Ezekiel down here, Ezekiel, Ezekiel. So it could be that we're, what we're looking at in our shadowy enthroned figure over on the right is the prophet himself hold, beholding the vision. Now, if, if I'm right, it brings up some other interesting questions that I don't have an answer to. Um, I think, and I'm, I'm, not everyone agrees with me, but I think this could be down here. This is the angel on the left side of Ani Cathedral. This could be a hand. And I'm showing it to you again here. I think these are fingers. I think that's a pinky. And I think it's holding something like, like that. So if I'm right, then we have another thing that connects to Ezekiel because in the images of the vision of Ezekiel, there is there are multiple hands, but there is a hand that's in the text. So Ezekiel 2, 9, and I looked and behold, a hand stretched out to me and it was a, with a, it was a scroll with writing. And in Armenian images of the scene, you can see the hands, the hands show up. So I wonder whether that's not what we're seeing over here. But again, more work needs to be done to, to either confirm or deny that. Um, oh, and then there's the elbow. What do you do with that green elbow? I still don't quite know. I'm delighted to take ideas. Um, there is another hand possibility in Ezekiel and I'm, I'm showing it to you here. Another hand, um, a disembodied hand um, providing some thing with Ezekiel. This is the famous scroll that Ezekiel is to eat. So, this is how far I got with my iconographical um, sort of charting of Ani Cathedral. You will see some question marks because there are still, there's still work to be done here, but this is the start. Um, I wanna to briefly touch on style. Mark, tell me if I'm going over because I, I usually use my computer to know what time it is, but anyway, um, style. One of the most interesting, good, thank you. One of the most interesting for me and pleasurable um, exercises an art historian uh, does, studying how something is painted. How does an artist choose to render a body or drapery over a body? Um, so this was a crucial question, not just for aesthetic reasons, but because it's also related to date. It's one of the ways that art historians will date something. They look at the way it is painted. So you see, for example, on the lower right, a beautiful detail of Christ um, in the Cars Gospel um, from the probably 11th century. And I want you to notice how beautiful that drapery is and the way it's tucked under his thigh um, in, a, in a whole lot of folds. Here we have my Ezekiel maybe again. And so we can look and think about the drapery in relation to, um, to other painted examples in manuscripts, Armenian manuscripts to try and help us determine date. What I did thus far is look at the best preserved parts of the fresco in order to make comparisons and establish a, a reasonable um, time frame for its production. So I looked at the um, the best preserved parts, including the throne. And I compared it to um, other th painted thrones. So I'm showing you on the left, you go on Honens, where you have a, a throne. Doesn't really look that similar to me at all. Much more similar is the throne from Lumbatavank, which you see on the left, which is big and bulky and has lots of jewels and um, has those wonderful, like what look like little pearls. Also similar to me were other seventh century wall paintings um, from Armenia 
And these are the pedestals uh, that Christ stands on at Mren and Aruj. So all in all, to me, the thrones really spoke more to a seventh, uh, let's say early medieval context and makes me comfortable with saying, oh, this fresco could be contemporaneous with the construction of the cathedral. That is, I'm not really buying a 13th century date for it at this moment. Um, also, another really nice comparison is with the Gospels of Adrianople, another Armenian manuscript dated to, um, I think, 1001, maybe 1010. But again, notice the bulkiness, the, the sort of the, 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 how quadrangular those beams are and the jeweled treatment, similar. Um, another interesting connection could be made with um, our beautiful angel. Notice the angel and notice the treatment of the wings. So is this like the wings at Tigran Hanens? To me, no, um, I'm, not, I'm not really seeing that. Um, those wings kind of extend from this weird bony part, which I don't know wing anatomy, but it's different from what you see over here. I see something thicker here. And um, maybe we can go. This feels to me more similar. Um, so this is from the Gospel of, um, of Kars again. And you have this same kind of radial bone or yeah, I think that's what it's called. Like a, but like a demarcation here of the top, almost like the spine of the wing, much as you do here in our case. So again, to me, the, um, in this case, early, early 11th century parallel is more convincing than the 13th century. Our last um, comparison is our beautiful ox. And I've looked for similar oxen. I've talked to people who have said they have oxen to show me that are like this. I still find my ox at Ani Cathedral absolutely stunningly exceptional in its naturalism, in its beautiful alert gaze. Um, and I would love to, have, I'm just plugging in my computer, I would love to be convinced by parallels, but thus far I'm showing you examples from various Armenian oxen, from manuscripts, wall painting. I think the Ani ox is outstandingly exceptional. Um, okay. To finish up, what are the implications? Uh, I think there, there are many, and this is, um, this is a, the, the tools I use to discover the frescoes are really useful for working in, um, in Ani and anywhere in Western Armenia because they are inconspicuous. I just had my camera. It, all of the work I did was post-production, I guess you would say. Um, so there was no problem with me just um, going in with my camera. I didn't even have a tripod. Um, it's useful not just for um, Ani Cathedral, obviously, but for many other churches, wherever you have wall paintings. So this is the Church of St. Gregory um, at uh, Ani Abu Ramrens. Here's some animation to show what happens when we put this into Photoshop. Um, it is possible to find not just images. Uh, this is another, another um, set of images from Abu Ramrens Church. It's possible also to find inscriptions. Um, I did this recently at Hromkla, and I'm just gonna end with this because this is my new obsession, um, where at Hromkla you can see, um, if you go online, you can go on YouTube, in fact, some a beautiful gatehouse, I won't tell you exactly where, but it has an Armenian inscription which is visible here. And so I, with that and with a, with a book that I found, I was able to decipher um, the name Hovanes or Hohanes, which I think may be the Catholicos Hovanes, um, Hovanes of Sis, who was a 13th century Catholicos at Ron Club. So, what I'm hoping to do, and this um, is something that would need a lot of different kinds of expertise, is, is really start an, a kind of scholarship on Armenian churches that makes um, good use of technological tools 
I wouldn't be the only one doing it. There are others who are doing this. I think so much can be done with inexpensive tools like Photoshop. Um, and uh, I think what we will find is a great enlargement of the corpus of Armenian art um, and also inscriptions. So I think with that, um, I will take questions. I think that maybe Mark, before I finish, Somewhat, I had been asked about issues of cultural heritage and, and I can either do that now, talk a little bit about cultural heritage now, or we can save it for a question, but either way. What Go right you... ahead. Okay, so um, Ani Cathedral is obviously uh, not in the Republic of Armenia, it's in the Republic of Turkey. And cultural, the, the restoration of cultural monuments in Ani is is at under the authority, as you all know, of the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. Um, and there, there has been work under those constraints at Ani for many years. And now it is a world, it's, it's a UNESCO um, site. What this means for the future of the preservation of the cathedral and all the church, Armenian churches in Turkey is unclear, um, but uh, I think the only thing that one can do is keep trying for um, to raise attention about Armenian churches and their fates and to do as much as we can to ensure their stability for future generations. I think first comes the architectural preservation, but a lot of the churches are also painted. So um, ideally preservation would take into account not just um, structure, but also the state of wall paintings because it's those are parts of the monument too. Um, I think that's, uh, I'll finish there and I will look forward to questions and yeah. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Very, very interesting uh, as, as ever. Uh, and I have a few interesting questions here yeah. as well that, that have been submitted. Some of them um, historical, some of them technical, I guess. Um, so for example, when do we know when the whitewash was applied and do we know what kind of materials were used to paint the frescoes in the first place. Yeah, we don't really know the answers to either one of those questions. Um, we can guess. So the whitewash could have been applied as early as the 11th century when Ani Cathedral was turned into a mosque. Now, of course, um, it could have been covered in some other way, the fresco, um, but, but that would have been the earliest moment. In terms of what, the, the, the chemical or the physical properties of the frescoes, that work hasn't been done. So one of the things that should be done would be testing of the, um, the, the properties of the painting. And in doing that, you would also probably find out something about the whitewash as well. So you'd probably be answering two questions in one, but I, I, that's why we need preservationists and experts in, in wall painting um, and conservationists rather to, to do work at the, at the site. Um, whether it's covert or whether it's overt is another matter, but uh, that work remains to be done. And that will also probably help with dating. That's my guess. Hmm. So supposing the political climate, let's say, were, were different, is there work, what, what kind of restoration or preservation work could be undertaken to either uh, better mm -hmm. preserve the, 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 the images as they are or to reveal them more? Right, that's a good question. So um, I've been working under the uh, sort of assumption that things won't change and, you know, of course you don't know, but um, is it better, I guess, I have asked myself to reveal the images or is it better to leave them hidden? And I think this is an interesting problem from many perspectives. 
um, if they, I, I think it would be great to be able to reveal them if it were done safely and they were not in any harm. That actually leads back to the previous question about what they're made of and, and, and you know, how safely could you bring them back to their full glory? I think it's also interesting uh, as an aesthetic question because we've always understood Ani Cathedral as this beautiful formalist, modernist, um, got, you know, proto-Gothic structure. It would look very different, I think, if you, you know, revealed those, those colorful paintings, it would be a different place. Um, those, those fascinating questions that I wouldn't want to come down on in terms of a judgment, I think they only ask of themselves further questions. So. Would, would, uh, would the use of infrared or other types of uh, photography uh, be beneficial and w is that allowed in the current uh, yeah. situation? I don't, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know about infrared. Um, I know there are a bunch of different techniques you can use for this. Like there are a lot of different tools that are already being used, um, like RTI, resonance transformation imaging and things like that. Um, but the, the bigger issue is the second part of that question, which is what would be allowed? And that would have to be run by the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. And, you know, that's the big, that's the sticking point. That's why just doing this simply and cheaply and under the radar is at least gives you a sense of what's there. But um, yeah, it would be nice to be able to do more with more elaborate and conspicuous probably equipment. I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. And we had back in the winter, a presentation of uh, uh, Bishop Balakian's book, The Ruins of yeah. Ani, written oh, 110 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. But what, if anything, has been done in terms of uh, archaeological exploration at Ani in, sin since that time? Oh, yeah, there, there has been. There's been a lot, but there's been almost nothing published. So we're all waiting to, to learn what the excavations have um, revealed. But it's, you know, there has been um, some work made available, but- um, Who has like been doing this work? Um, well, so a few different people. There is a resident archeologist at Ani, and I forgot her name. There's a restoration architect, Yavuzovskaya. Um, but the, the work I'm thinking of that has been brought to light is a collaborative effort of um, uh, Armen Kazarian, Yavu Zoskaya and um, Alin Pontiolu, which is a an essay on Supergich, um, to the Church of the Savior, which talks about the restoration and talks about the architecture and using some some new uh, evidence and data. So that's maybe the closest thing to what you were hoping to to learn in terms of like archaeological reports. I don't know of anything yet. Um, I know that the projects are being done, but I don't know of any anything that I've been able to see uh, reporting on archaeology within the last, you know, few decades, you know, after Mars time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, the the question about the date, the dating of of the frescoes. Actually, there's two questions about the dating of the frescoes. One is what is the earliest yeah. known date for Armenian wall frescoes uh, and uh, anywhere in historic Armenia? Okay. And then the second question is is from Stephen Sim, with, uh, with ah. whom I know you've traveled to Ani, I think, and, and elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, and, and who is the keeper of the virtual Ani online. Wow. And his question is, could this change, uh, could the could it be indicative of the transfer of control of the city from Bagratid to Byzantine rule? Oh. Uh, and another question actually wonders about the influence of uh, of Greek the the occurrence of Greek influence and the occurrence of frescoes. Whether there's a connection. Very interesting. There as well. Wow. Okay. 
first question, I guess I would answer the the way people would answer would be Erebuni, or which is uh, the earliest, uh, as far as I know, wall painting uh, in Armenia. So that would be what eighth century BC E. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it goes back a long way. Um, and then, hi Steve. I've been wondering how you're doing. So good to hear from you. I had the Byzantine connection is really interesting. Yeah, what if it were painted during the period of Byzantine control? So 1040-ish, interesting concept. Of course, then you have to reckon that was the was that inscription painted earlier? Um, the Armenian inscription. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm open to the idea of it. Um, I don't think it's 13th century, but I could see 10th, 11th, and the 11th saying 11th would would allow for for some Byzantine connections. Um, I like being, you know, I don't know. I, I would like it to be dated to the um, time when the cathedral was completed. That is 1001, but I'm willing to to push it out. You know, it's not for me necessarily to make this determination. Anyway, the last question about, um, let's see. It, Greek influence, Byzantine influence, and the occurrence of frescoes in yeah. general. Right. So this is an interesting question because um, you will hear um, Armenians having problems with the veneration of icons. You will hear this going back to sources in the 10th and 11th centuries. And the Armenians and Byzantines were kind of fighting it out about icons, among other things, all, the, all kinds of ritual issues. So um, that, that information or that te literary testimony is often used to say that Armenians um, didn't venerate icons, they didn't produce icons, they worshiped the cross. And um, that this, uh, this, these sources have had kind of their own life. The fact is that Armenians did um, have wall paintings in churches, and we can see this. They even, they, Armenian, an Armenian rite from Ani, from the 10th, 11th centuries, actually is specifically for the blessing of wall paint, churches with wall paintings. So there is evidence within the Armenian church that Armenians were, were painting and in fact um, blessing, making sacred these wall paintings by, by anointing them. So I think that the question of the relationship with, with Byzantium and Byzantine icon veneration is a very complicated one. It's not simply Armenians did, did this, the Byzantines did this. Um, there was a lot more change, a lot more fluidity. And the more I'm in this field, the more I work, the more I see that Armenians um, made and venerated icons and did it in a particular way. And this rite of um, blessing is nothing like what you have in Byzantium. They don't have a blessing of icons. This is something very special that the Armenians do. So um, I am, you're, you're, that, that actually hits on some things that, that need much more study, I think. Um, but the, 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 the thought really was um, that, Armen that in Ani, Armenians didn't produce wall paintings. That they're for like, so, I mean, not just like Ani in general, but Ani in the 10th, 11th century. So Bagratid Ani, there were no wall paintings. Um, and I think we've shown that that may be wrong. Sorry, that was kind of rambling. It's a big subject. It's a fascinating subject. And there, we, there are, there's so much evidence we just haven't even tapped into yet. Sources, um, images. Next time I'm on this show, I'll tell you about a Surenyant's painting that has an icon in it that is, what, do you know about this already? Anyway, it's a, it's a Surenyant's painting um, that has a tiny little icon of St. Bartholomew in it that um, looks a lot like a 10th century Armenian manuscript, but it's just, 
There's a lot of interesting stuff. I'm not going to give away everything right now, but we talked about it. But that's okay. We'll look. Oh, we to did. Yeah, it. never mind. Okay. Getting Any old. Final <laughs> words, Christina. No, I, I miss everybody, and um, I know there are a lot of friends out there watching, and um, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody again soon at NASA. And everybody. please, and everybody support NASA because NASA is the best place in the world for Armenian studies. Thank you very much. Everybody is applauding right now, including me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And, uh, everybody, thank you for participating. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your patience. And uh, please get on our email list if you are not, and you will be informed about other upcoming events. Follow us on Facebook and other social media, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you all and keep well. Goodbye.